Well, hello again, my friends and fellow members of the Invisible College, and indeed anyone else who might be seeing this little lecture. Today I want to talk to you about um, the history of esotericism, because I think some people think that this is something that's a new invention, that uh, people didn't think this way in the past, that it's just a kind of uh, new agey sort of uh, fantasy. Well, I'm here to tell you that it isn't. It's something that has been with us f as long as uh, we know of in history, uh, in recorded history, and probably long before that as well. It's the whole quest for finding the true way. Why are we here? What is our purpose? Um, it's a very odd situation that we find ourselves in to find ourselves on this at times beautiful planet uh, in bodies, we don't know where they came from really, um, with lifespan maybe 70 years, maybe a bit longer. Um, and it's a big mystery as to how this all comes about. And people have been struggling with this question. Uh, it's probably since the time of Adam actually, <laughs> um, and before even. So, it's not a new thing, it's not a new age cult thing, it's something that is uh, the basis actually of all civilization and we have many records to do with this over the centuries and I'm going to go into some of that today. So before I do that I want to read to you a little piece from a gentleman called Peter Uspensky. Right, I'm going to read you a couple of extracts from Uspensky's book. Um, I regard this as one of the most interesting books of the 20th century on many different levels. It's not perfect and there are things I think he got wrong, but it, I would recommend all of you, everyone, to read this book. It, uh, it's quite eye-opening. Anyway, it begins this way. I returned to Russia in November 1914. I should say he was a Russian. That is, at the beginning of the First World War, after a rather long journey through Egypt, Ceylon and India. The war had found me in Colombo, and from there I went back through England. When leaving Petersburg at the start of my journey, I had said that I was going to seek the miraculous. The miraculous is very difficult to define. But for me, this word had a quite definite meaning. I had come to the conclusion a long time ago that there was no escape from the labyrinth of contradictions in which we live, except by an entirely new road, unlike anything hitherto known or used by us. But where this new or forgotten road began, I was unable to say. Or I already knew then, as an undoubted fact, that beyond the thin film of false reality, there existed another reality from which, for some reason, something separated us. The miraculous was a penetration into this unknown reality. And it seemed to me that the way to the unknown could be found in the East. Why in the East? It was difficult to answer this. In this idea, there was perhaps something of romance but it may have been the absolutely real conviction that in any case nothing could be found in Europe. When I went away I already knew I was going to look for a school or schools. I had arrived at this long ago. I realised that personal individual efforts were insufficient and that it was necessary to come into touch with the real and living thought which must be in existence somewhere, but with which we had lost contact. On my departure, I still admitted much that was fantastic in relation to schools. I imagined, for example, the possibility of making contact with schools of the distant past, with schools of Pythagoras, with schools of Egypt, with the schools of those who built Notre Dame, and so on. It seemed to me that the barriers of time and space should disappear on making such contact. The idea of schools in itself was fantastic, and nothing seemed to me too fantastic in relation to this idea. On the return journey, 
After a whole series of meetings and impressions, the idea of schools became much more real and tangible and lost its fantastic character. This probably took place chiefly because, as I then realised, school required not only a search but selection or choice, I mean on our side. That schools existed I did not doubt, but at the same time I became convinced that the schools I heard about and with which I could have had come into contact were not for me. Anyway, Uspensky came back to Russia and it was not long after that that he met the man who was going to be his own teacher, George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, you can see here. And I'd like to read out to you his description of their first meeting. I remember this meeting very well. We arrived at a small cafe in a noisy, though not central, street. I saw a man of an oriental type, no longer young, with a black moustache and piercing eyes, who astonished me first of all because he seemed to be disguised, and completely out of keeping with the place and its atmosphere. I was still full of impressions of the East, and this man, with the face of an Indian Raja, or an Arab Sheikh, whom I had once seen to see in a white banous or a gilded turban, seated here in this little cafe, where small dealers and commission agents met together, in a black overcoat with a velvet collar and a black bowler hat, produced this strange, unexpected and almost alarming impression of a man poorly disguised, the sight of whom embarrasses you because you see he is not what he pretends to be. And yet you have to speak and behave as though you did not see it. He spoke Russian incorrectly with a strong Caucasian accent and this accent with which we are accustomed to associate anything apart from philosophical ideas strengthens still further the strangeness and the unexpectedness of this impression. So you see here, Uspensky, he's a bit of a snob, <laughs> I might think. Uh, he, uh, full of the impressions of the East, and then he comes to meet this man who, uh, in other circumstances, he probably wouldn't uh, have ever come across. But because he was attuned to that um, milieu, it happened, of course, because he received a postcard telling him about uh, a meeting that was going to be held. Uh, normally speaking, he would not have responded to that, but because he was attuned to looking for schools, he took this seriously and he went along and he met this man who became the most important influence on the rest of his life. And that's very much typical of uh, the way people come into contact with uh, esoteric schools. They, are, they begin with a search. They're looking for truth. They're looking for something else. They're looking for the miraculous. They see that the life we're leading is superficial. It has no meaning to it. They, look, they long to find something else. And by they might not find it where they think they will. They think they have to go abroad. They think they have to go to Kathmandu or Tibet or some place to find the truth. But the truth is very often in their own back garden. <laughs> it's in their own city even, if they'll only have the eyes to see it. Now, Gurdjieff himself had done his own journeying and he wrote a semi-autobiographical book uh, called Meetings with Remarkable Men and that was turned into a movie actually you can go and see um starring terence stamp and i think that's him in the image there terence stamp was a famous british actor of the period he's still alive i believe anyway gurdjieff claimed to have gone to all sorts of different monasteries and and places and he came back with this wisdom which he put into a system is that which he started teaching in russia and later in Europe. So this whole idea of the esoteric tradition being passed down from ancient sources 
down to the present, there always is an esoteric school somewhere in the world, but you're not going to necessarily find it unless you're someone who is attuned to it. Uspensky himself calls that having a magnetic center. Um, he just talks about that a lot in his book. But you have to be attuned to find, wanting to find a school, realizing that it's important that you do, and hoping that uh, through that you're going to achieve something special. You're going to find uh, the Holy Grail or, or the uh, open the chakras or whatever it is um, that you're hoping for. So I'll carry on now. Well, let's get on with our own quest, um, which we are doing now. Now, a student of both Gurdjieff and Uspensky was this gentleman, J.G. Bennett, who had been a young uh, British Army officer, I think he's only about 21, who is running this, the British Intelligence Department just after the First World War. Uh, he was based in Constantinople, as it was called then. We would call it Istanbul today. And he met Gurdjieff through uh, a friend of his, the prince uh, of the royal, the, the Ottoman uh, Sultanate, um, who was a friend of his, and Gurdjieff was also a friend. He met him there first, and then he later met him with Uspensky. Um, sort of serendipity, I guess, when they rented a, a room from him in the house he was living in. So uh, he was intrigued by what they had. But Gurdjieff and Uspensky, I should say, had left Russia because of the revolution and uh, with another, a, a bunch of the pupils of the former school that Gurdjieff had been running in Moscow and St. Petersburg, they ended up uh, first of all in Georgia and then in Turkey and Constantinople. So Bennett uh, uh, arranged for Uspensky to come to England where he had uh, fran fans, I should say, of an earlier book he had written. Um, particularly the uh, wife of the owner of the Daily Mail, uh, Lady Rothermere, had uh, heard of Uspensky. And they, so he had powerful friends who were able to help him to come back to Britain. And that's where Uspensky spent most of the rest of his life. Um, he died in 1947. So anyway, Bennett became his student and uh, he, in due course, he, he had quite an adventurous life himself and he did lots of different things. But he, at the end of his life, I think in about 1970 or 71, he set up a school of his own in a place called Sherborne House, which was near Cheltenham in Gloucestershire. And I went to see him in 72 and I had a, an interview with him. And I, was taken into this small room and I sat on the chair and he said you're now sitting in the chair uh, Uspensky's chair that he sat on when he was writing in search of the miraculous so <laughs> I was a little bit taken aback you know because I'd read that book a couple of years earlier and I, I was absolutely amazed by it so the fact that I was now sitting on the the, uh, the chair of this man who had written this book that which I was very very impressed with uh, was quite something. Anyway, I came to meet Bennett a few more times. Um, but again, by serendipity, I ended up getting a job with a publisher, a small publisher uh, called Turnstone Press, and they were publishing Bennett's books. So Bennett came to the office and I met him again there. And then he, he did some lectures also in Kensington uh, during that period, but he died in 74. And uh, I then made a study of virtually everything he had written. I regard him as one of my teachers. And uh, I also regard Gurdjieff and Uspensky as, as my teachers, uh, although I never met them. <laughs> and I didn't attend Bennett's own school, but I studied his work in depth. And I actually believe, unlike Uspensky, that you can uh, come in touch with ancient schools of the past, uh, that they don't just all disappear. Um, but that's another story. 
you know, we'll talk about that later. Anyway, Bennett was himself convinced that Gurdjieff had got his secret knowledge, let's call it, esoteric knowledge, from the Sufi tradition of uh, Persia and uh, the uh, Central Asian areas. Uh, I don't agree with that. Um, I think Gurdjieff was uh, in touch with a school, if you like to call it that, which was essentially Christian, but not the mainstream Christian that we meet with in our churches today. It was a more Eastern form of Christianity uh, that still existed, perhaps in small pockets. He says he met some uh, teachers or masters or priests of this a group in part of Afghanistan. It's Afghanistan now. It wasn't at that time when he was doing his journey in the 1880s. Uh, so, be it as it may, I believe that Gurdjieff's chief inspirations were Christian. He knew about Islam, but he was not a Muslim. He was a Christian, and he was buried by the Russian Orthodox Church in Paris. So, um, enough said on that. Um, going back to other sources of Gurdjieff, and he was definitely into alchemy, or, or he studied alchemy. So we'll have a little look at what they had to say. And the medieval alchemists revered the prophet Hermes Trismegistus, and that was the Greek name for Thoth, or Toth, Toth. <laughs> I don't know how they would have pronounced it. Uh, he was the, uh, the Egyptian god of science, writing and learning. Now, when we use this word God, uh, it had a much broader sense in ancient times than it does today. We're not talking about um, these creator uh, disembodied beings like Jupiter or something. We're talking about men or women who have something extra that uh, highly developed. We, I think probably saint would be a better term in our uh, understanding. If we called if we made a separation between God, you know, the creator of the universe, and saints or archangels, uh, that would be, be a better terminology. And uh, it's unfortunate we just have this one word in English that we use all the time. And in other European languages, I think it's the same. Um, and it gives the false impression that you are necessarily, if you were a follower of thought or taught, that you worshipped him as God. They didn't. They understood him as a teacher. And he had perhaps been a person. See, just as in the Catholic Church, um, a very holy man, when he dies, and, and if certain miracles are performed or happen in his name, he can be put forward to become a saint. So, um, uh, a good example of that is Padre Pio, who was alive in, into the 1960s, and he had the stigmata in his hands. Um, and he is now a saint, Padre Pio, in the Catholic Church. And I think it was rather the same with people like Thot, Toth. Uh, he was a great teacher, taught them how to write hieroglyphs for a start. Um, he's said to be the inventor of the pyramids, or the building the pyramids. Um, so they would say, well, he was a great saint, and the word neta, neteru or neta would be appri uh, applied to him by the Egyptians, and we translate that as God. I think saint would be a better term, probably. Anyway, getting back, it's like the biblical Enoch, uh, who was the great grandfather of Noah, Hermes had had an out of body experience and been shown the mysteries of heaven. Hermes was also credited with having built the pyramids as a repository of knowledge from the antediluvian age. That antediluvian means before the flood. He had great knowledge now lost to us. So in other words, there was a, a great flood, the flood of Noah, and a lot of knowledge was lost to us. And I think a lot of people are onto this um, today that um, the pyramids, when you look at them and the, 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 the way the stone, stones are cut, the weight of them, uh, the, the preciseness of it is out of keeping with the 
Bronze Age in which it's supposed to have been built. You know, <laughs> these people are supposed to have had pounding balls and copper tools. How are they going to build a pyramid made of with lots of granite? You know, in the king's chambers lined with granite, uh, many many different blocks of it, and the receiving uh, the relieving chambers above it. Uh, it doesn't fit, and also many of the statues carved out of uh, basalt and, and granite and these very, very hard stones. Um, how do they do it with copper tools and, and, and producing such perfect perfection of look, um, these uh, Egyptian pharaoh statues? And the only credible answer is that these are relics from an earlier civilization that were reused in later periods. Uh, and attributed to later pharaohs, but there was, seems to have been some kind of culture before them that was much more advanced in these kind of techniques, using techniques we don't even know now. Anyway, um, there are people in, into all of that. Now then, um, Hermes Thoth Enoch, the various names that he's given, founded a school of philosophy. Now that's probably um, at a place called Hermopolis Magna, which was the city associated most with Hermes. But it would have been branches in other places too, probably throughout the kingdom. And a later initiate of this school was this gentleman. Um, known as King Djoza <laughs> by the Egyptologists. Now, just a couple of words here. Um, King Djoza supposedly lived within the Third Dynasty. It, the last, I think he's the last king of the Third Dynasty. And that's in Manetho's list of Egyptian kings in dynasties. But Manetho only lived in, I think it's the 3rd century AD, he was a priest living in Alexandria, a monk, and he compa uh, compiled a list. He went round Egypt and checked out different uh, king lists found written on walls, um, also probably in books in Alexandria, and he compiled what he believed was the correct king list, uh, a dynasty list. Unfortunately, we don't have his book. Um, you know, Manetho's book has disappeared. All we have are epitomes written by later writers, mostly Byzantine, um, telling what, us what they thought, you know, was what he had written. Usually in books that are going to uh, castigate the Egyptians as uh, not being Christian, basically. <laughs> so these are written by Christian monks. So how much credence can we give to these king lists of Manetho? Uh, well, they're the basis of modern Egyptology. They use those king lists as a, uh, a time chart to work out uh, Egyptian history. So if Manetho made a mistake, and I believe he did, uh, maybe it wasn't him, maybe it's someone else before him, um, and put Djoza into the third dynasty, um, it upset everything else. Um, anyway, this Djoza, uh, he was equated, uh, uh, yes, a later initiative of this school was called Imhotep, or he who came in peace. He was equated with Djoza, sometimes regarded as a pharaoh of the third dynasty. This is a mistake. In actuality, he was Joseph, the son of Jacob, Israel, who saved Egypt at a time of great famine. Now, why do I say this? Well, we have the biblical story of Joseph. Uh, you know, Joseph with the multicolored coat, uh, who was sold into slavery by his brothers and went to Egypt, first of all as a slave, and then he interpreted dreams. And he gradually went up the hierarchy till he came to the uh, attention of Pharaoh himself. And he interpreted Pharaoh's dream of seven fat cows followed by seven thin cows. 
as referring to um, seven years of great harvests, fat harvests, followed by seven years of famine. And he said to the Pharaoh, you must dig, uh, you know, create silos and store grain uh, so that you'll have that, you know, during the, the fat years, so you'll have food for the people in the thin years, you know, the times of famine. So the Pharaoh did that and saved Egypt. And the Israelites, or the family of Israel, Jacob, came looking to buy grain from Canaan. And by this time, Joseph was the vizier. He's the second man of, of Egypt after the Pharaoh. And he's the one put in charge of, uh, you know, first of all, getting the grain you know, harvest stored and then setting up the, the facility for selling the grain afterwards in the lean years. So he was able to be reunited with his family. Now that's very important, I believe, because we have around the end of the, the Old Kingdom, uh, we have a period called the First Intermediate Period. Nobody knows what caused the First Intermediate Period, um, but a famine would be a good, good thing would might cause a period of upset, and the, the 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 kingdom came to be ruled by what they call the shepherd kings, and the shepherd kings came from the north. They called them the Hyksos in Egypt, and the Hyksos uh, ruled this intermediate period, and they were basically from the north, from Canaan. You put the two things together, Joseph uh, came from this family of shepherds. You know, Jacob, Israel, he, he was a shepherd. and They came from the north and they came to Egypt. Joseph saved Egypt. He was a vizier to the pharaoh. Put two and two together, it makes sense that he or his family became the rulers of at least that part of Egypt. You know, we're talking about the, the Delta area. Um, probably a different set of pharaohs further south down near Thebes. And, you know, for a time there may have been these two lots of pharaohs ruling different uh, parts of Egypt. It might not have been called a pharaoh, it might have been called, a, you know, a high priest or a, a vizier or something like that. But anyway, Joseph would have been the ruler of that part of Egypt in effect. And it's not unlikely that um, his sons and maybe grandsons carried on the ruling and it went on, at least for a while. And then the, the, uh, the Israelites you know, became many in number and the Egyptians became jealous and, and they were in, made slaves before they escaped under Moses in the time of the Exodus. So this begins to make a connection between Egyptian history and what we know of the history in the Bible. Now Joseph, if he built silos, there are huge uh, trenches or pits dug in the ground at Saqqara on the West Bank. Um, and there are people who have said that these were the silo pits. They found traces of grain inside them. And they're certainly huge. They're big enough to, to act as grain silos. So if they're, they're not pyramids, you know, no pyramids are built on top. There's no explanation for these deep shafts to go down 60 feet or more into the ground, into the, the rock. Um, but they could well have functioned as silos and they could go down into the silos to get the grain to sell it. So... This begins to make a picture of something being done at Saqqara uh, on the West Bank. It's a secure location, it would have been, a royal enclosure. And uh, there we see a certain building. And it's this building here called the Step Pyramid. And Egyptologists tell us that this was the first pyramid. Now, I don't believe this. Rather, I believe it was built much later. They think it's the first pyramid because it's much rougher in construction than the later pyramids of Giza, you know, the, the Great Pyramid and the, 
uh, Pyramid of Khafra and Pyramid of Isorinos, the ones that Robert Boval and I wrote about as representing the Belt of Orion. Um, this pyramid looks much more crude, and near it there are this enclosure built with mud brick walls. Well, we read about mud brick walls in the Bible, that there is Israelites having to build mud brick walls. We read about that um, in the Bible. So it fits with this maybe later period. And I know this pyramid is actually made of stone blocks, but uh, it's not as as good craftsmanship, you would say, as the later, the earlier pyramids, as I would call them. And it's a step pyramid. Now, why is it a step pyramid? Well, Joseph, the jo Joseph was the vizier at, to the pharaoh at the time of the Great Famine. He likely lived at the start of the first intermediate period, around 2000 BC. He and his successors are the Hyksos, of shepherd kings. And you read about those. I mean, uh, Joseph came from a family of shepherds. So shepherd kings is not a bad name for Joseph and his, uh, his tribe. Anyway, so I believe he built this step pyramid as a reminder of the Great Famine. I and mean, if you look at it, you see that it has six steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, the topmost step might easily have had another step on top, or perhaps a little temple or something else, maybe a pyramidion, um, showing that that was the top. And the seven steps would be equivalent to the seven um, periods of famine. So I think that that's what this is meant to do to represent the seven years of famine and it was put there as a reminder to the Egyptians of the famine and how they needed to uh, make sure they lived up to the correct standards expected of them by God or another famine might come to them. So it's a sort of memento mori. Many people died no doubt in that famine in spite of them having the grain stored up. So you have to uh, take uh, responsibility and uh, also it's a memorial to him for the great things he did and actually there is a the statue of Zoza is right next to this this pyramid so we can see the connections here when they excavated into the the step pyramid underneath it, it's been excavated now it's a big complex of tunnel, tunnels underneath and I think people were buried under there but that might have been done later. Uh, you never know. Um, or maybe it was the family of Pharaoh. He, he wanted to be buried un under the step pyramid. But they also found an awful lot of um, objects, amazing objects. That, um, And you can see some of these objects here. And what makes them so amazing is that they're made of hard granite. And there were, I think, something like 4,000 of these granite bowls and jugs and, and this extraordinary kind of uh, propeller. I think it maybe was a, a fan, an air fan of some sort. It's difficult to know what it was used for, but that's made from diorite. And you can see how thin the blades are on that, bent back like that. Um, this would be quite a fragile object if you dropped it. And, and mum mistake as you're making it, and the whole thing's ruined. Uh, so how on earth do they make this? They certainly didn't do it with copper tools and pounding balls and you know rubbing sand roughly with a piece of wood or something. This was done with, perhaps with a lathe, but it seems like they made a disc and then somehow melted the diorite and were able to bend back these tongues. Uh, it's extraordinary. The same thing with that bowl on the top left there. It looks like that was sort of done on some kind of spinning device to make it round and then they had some kind of melting technology to soften the granite, to bend it like that. And that vase, as many of these vases, and uh, not only is it sort of perfectly round with a narrower top than the bottom and you couldn't, you couldn't get your hand inside to, to grind out the inside. Um, doing that on a lathe even today 
would be extraordinarily difficult, let alone with those handles that uh, for carrying the thing. How on earth did you make that and have those handles and have them look like they're stuck on when they're not? They're made from the actual stone. It's almost like it was cast, but it's made of granite. Um, this is a technology we don't know. It's an alien technology to us, and it doesn't fit with the um, what we know about dynastic Egypt. So all these objects were placed underneath this pyramid as if to store them for later times. And if it was Joseph who put them there, uh, I suspect that he had, he knew that there was a had been an earlier civilization before the Egyptian pharaohs that, that we know of, you know, Khufu, Khafre, and the rest of them. And he wanted to preserve these things for the future. So instead of having people using them and breaking them, he gathered them up and put them under the pyramid there. That's what I think. But they are anomalous uh, objects that don't fit with the supposed history that we're meant to believe in. Joseph, Josa Imhotep, was also called Asclepius by the Greeks. And the Bible tells us that Joseph was married to the daughter of the high priest and he would have known all about the religion of the Egyptians and the role of Thoth. He revived and reformed the hermetic school of Thoth Hermes. And the staff and serpent is the same as the Caduceus or Caduceus of Mercury. It symbolizes energy rising up the spine. This is called Kundalini in India, and it gives certain powers. Thus, Asclepius Imhotep Joseph was a healer. So, uh, I'll just say a couple of words here. I mean, you've you've seen the the uh, the caduceus. It's used as a symbol of of medicine, a doctor's symbol, isn't it? With the two snakes, snakes round a staff, the caduceus of Mercury. And that's you know connected with Asclepius, who in the Greek terminology was the god of healing. <laughs> uh, I prefer to use the word saint of healing, uh, Saint Asclepius. And what's so interesting is when you read the Hermetica, the later uh, writings from in Greek from Alexandria done during the Greco-Roman period, they talk about Asclepius as being um, a disciple or student of Hermes. And Hermes is equated with Thoth. So you have the idea of Imhotep, who is also Joseph, who is also Asclepius, being the student of Hermes, who is also Thoth, who is also Enoch, the Hebrew prophet from before the flood. How could that be? Well, it could be if uh, Joseph was a student or had learnt the uh, knowledge of the Egyptians and he was in touch, you could say psychically, with this earlier school. That's how he could be learning from it. And we'll talk about a bit more about that sort of thing as we go on a bit further. Now, the Greek mathematician and philosopher Pythagoras also studied in Egypt. And this is undoubtedly where he learnt the theorem today accredited to him, the Pythagoras theorem. The square on the hypotenuse is equal to the square on the other two sides. Uh, for example, if you have a, a 3 4 5 triangle, that's a right angle triangle, by the way, um, the hypotenuse is 5. Well, you can check that. If you have one side of 3 and the other of 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, 16 plus 9 is 25, and the square root of 25 is 5. That's because 5 times 5 equals 25. So you can see that Pythagoras' theorem certainly applies for you know, that kind of right-angled triangle. It actually applies to all right-angled triangles. So he would have learnt about that while he was in Egypt. That's the obvious place to learn about it because they're the ones who practice geometry to the highest standards. Um, he was later taken to Babylon 
by King Cambyses of Persia, who invaded Egypt. Uh, I think it was 529, or maybe a little later than that, uh, that he invaded Egypt and made it part of the Persian Empire. So he took the wise men that he could find, and that included Pythagoras, who happened to be there at the time. You know, he was a tourist, but he still got taken back to Babylon, this Greek. So he would have learnt a lot of stuff in Babylon as well. Um, and he then later moved to Sicily, where he founded his own school in Crotona. Uh, he was taught the relationship between mathematics, music and astronomy. So, you know, the music of the spheres and all of that. And Pythagoras was murdered in 495 BC. Again, his teachings, or at least what has survived of these, bears resemblance to the later teachings of other schools. So he left a legacy as well. <clears throat> of course, the greatest esoteric teacher of all time is Jesus Christ. He called his school uh, his church. And that word derives from the Greek kirkos, or circle. Kirkos means circle. Same as the Latin word circus, C-I-R-C-U-S, C's instead of K's. But it should be a very hard K or a hard C. <coughs> so kirkos. And the O-S on the end is to decline the word, which you do in Greek, you'd be in the U-S in Latin, um, so you can have, if you know any Latin, nominative, accusative, genitive, dative, ablative. You remember that from Latin, if any, any of you have done Latin? Um, in English, we don't do that. We just have the word. So you cut off the OS, you have kirk, which is what the Scots call a church. And actually, we should call it a kirk, kirk as well. The CH should be a hard, um, you know, more like a K, uh, not a ch sound, a k sound. So uh, he formed a circle, and his circle was the circle of disciples. It wasn't a building, although they did build later churches octagonal. Uh, you see that some of these, if you go to Israel, if you go to Jerusalem and the St. Peter's House Church um, up on the Sea of Galilee, you'll see these eight-sided, what would, were eight-sided buildings, and actually, the Dome of the Rock is also an eight-sided building. I believe it's built on the site of an earlier church, a kirk. Anyway, that's another subject. Unfortunately, as always happens with schools, after a few generations, his church got turned into a hierarchical pyramid of power. The apostles were the real thing, but the later priesthoods, became like the Pharisees, obsessed with rank and fancy costumes. This tends to happen to esoteric schools. It is why new ones have to emerge at regular intervals. So I don't want to point fingers too much, but if you go into a, a Catholic or Orthodox church, you'll see people dressed in robes and fancy costumes and doing rituals and... Uh, lots of iconography and lot, you know, all this colour and, and X, etc. It's great, you know, it's a great performance, great theatre. But it's not exactly what Jesus was doing when he was wandering around Galilee with his party of disciples. Um, you know, they were essentially poor people, or certainly they weren't um, flaunting wealth. He had one or two at least disciples who were well off and looked after them but uh, it wasn't a big money-making scheme with huge buildings with gold fittings and gold cloth robes and all of that that all came later and unfortunately it caused the separation between those who are running it and those who are the audience or the the people and the those who are running it tend to get above themselves and they, they become like the Pharisees, focusing on the letter of the law, pretending they have powers that they don't really, and misleading the people to a large extent who need to work on themselves to transform themselves, which is what a true school is all about. So this tends to happen 
um, with schools, and it's happened time and again. And I'm not saying that there's nothing in the, the Catholic Church or other churches that wear fancy robes. There certainly is, and they do a very good job with holding society together, you know, commonality, shared belief, shared desire to do good, shared desire to help the poor, all of those things, that's, that's very good. But there is an esoteric core that also needs to be nurtured, and that is done by esoteric schools. Now, the true Church of Jesus was brought to Britain by his uncle, Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible tells us that Joseph took down the body of Jesus from the cross and buried it in his own tomb. Um, almost certainly he owned the house where the Last Supper took place. The cup or grail, more likely a mixing bowl or crater, would have belonged to him anyway. So think about that. They had the Last Supper. Well, in Roman times, and we're talking about Roman times, uh, it was normal to pour wine from... They had these big, gigantic amphorae. You couldn't pour that into a cup easily. You poured it into a, a bowl and you mixed it with water. And then you doled out uh, the water in cups. Or at the Last Supper, they're dipping their bread into it, into the bowl. And that big bowl is um, like a punch bowl, we would call it today. Uh, it's sort of they're making punch. <laughs> and um, the, the, the punch bowl, I think, or the crater, would have been what Joseph kept. It might have been made of silver. It might have been very valuable because Joseph, by tradition, um, and you'll find this in lots of books, uh, was a tin trader. He used to go to Cornwall and buy tin there and take it back and sell it to people in the Roman Empire, particularly perhaps in Judea. Uh, and he made a lot of money that way. He was quite wealthy. Probably also bought other uh, metals as well. There's lead from, particularly from the Mendip Hills in northern Somerset and also in Wales. They had uh, copper and lead and uh, even gold. So he was a trade, coming to the British Isles regularly, buying precious metals and taking them back. And we know that this was going on. Um, Britain at that time was the uh, most important, if not the sole source of getting tin that you need for making bronze. So if you wanted to make bronze in the Bronze Age, you can get copper from Cyprus. That's what the, the word Cyprus comes from, cupress, cupressus. Yeah, meaning the Copper Island. So, um, but you needed tin as well. And they had a few other ingredients, secret ingredients that people knew about. But that's, you know, that's all part of alchemy. Um, Joseph, anyway, he, he, the tradition says he came back to Britain. He brought a party of disciples with him, including the Holy Family, they say. Um, that he was Jesus' uncle, the, the brother of Mary. So that would be why he would have owned an important building in Jerusalem. He's a wealthy man. He's going to have a good house, isn't he? Um, that's where they held the Last Supper. And he also owned a freshly cut tomb, a fe freshly cut family tomb. Well, is he, he's the guy who's made the money in the family. They haven't already got a family sepulchre. The, um, the normal tradition in among the Jews was they laid the body out, you let it rot there for uh, a, w a little while, a few couple of years, and then you go in there and you gather the bones, you clean them up, and you put them in a casket um, made of uh, uh, limestone, you know, not very big, and you bury that. Um, so that would have been the plan. But of course, the plan didn't happen because Jesus rose from the dead. So that's a, a whole other subject too. But he brought the teachings from, the, uh, uh, from Judea to Britain and founded schools. Um, he founded what later came to be known as the Grail School. The Grail itself is a symbol and not an object. Well, there may have been this bowl or maybe a cup, uh, an actual object, but that's not what it's all about. That's not why we remember the Grail story. 
The Grail School of Joseph was revived in the 6th century at the time of King Arthur. And Camelot was in Wales. It was the city of Caerleon. So King Arthur had a round table, and that is, in itself is not um, a school of initiation. It, it is a, a collaborative group. Uh, it is a round table of the knights uh, sharing and doing good works. Um, but it's only really a preparation for the Grail school, which was going to be revived. And you have the story of how the Grail appears to King Arthur and his knights on Whitson, and it feeds them each night with what most pleases him. Well, that's to do with transmission of very high energies that um, feed the human spirit. And once you had a taste of that, nothing else is good enough. Nothing else uh, matches up to that. So they then all go off on quest to find the Holy Grail, um, the Holy Grail that can bring eternal life. And only a few of them succeed. But the, the ones who do succeed, they, um, they are promised this eternal life and they become a school of grail keepers. So anyway, King Arthur had his, his uh, circle of knights at Caerleon, which you can go and visit today. It was an ro old Roman town originally, um, but then the Romans departed it. I think at, towards the end of the first century, they didn't stay there very long, and it became a Welsh town. But it's had all the amenities, uh, bathhouses and this big amphitheatre, which is the real round table, I think, um, and probably nice places to live. So Arthur wasn't going to go and live on a drafty old hilltop, <laughs> as so many people think. Oh, they, after the Romans went, they went up to the, the hilltops and fought against us. And Arthur's going to inhabit one of the remaining cities, and this city of Caerleon is very well protected, uh, and that's where uh, Camelot, Camelot was. The Grail is not an, uh, an actual vessel as such, but a holy presence. It has to be sought for, but will disappear if the keepers are, not, are unworthy. A later attempt at reviving the Grail school was by the Knights Templar. They were a brotherhood of knights whose sworn purpose was to prepare the way for the expected imminent return of Jesus Christ to the kingdom of Jerusalem. However, those sworn to poverty, chastity and obedience, they grew exceedingly rich. When Jerusalem fell to the Saracens, it was evident that their mission had failed. They were disbanded on orders of the Pope in 1315. So, a couple of words on that. Um, the Knights Templar are a very romantic uh, brotherhood that uh, people are very interested in these days uh, for two reasons. One is that they lived in Jerusalem or they had their centre there for a time until they were kicked out, um, I think, in 1197, was it? Um, anyway, the, the Saracens kicked them out, Saladin and uh, the Saracens, uh, and took over Jerusalem. And the Christians hung on to the coast at Acre for quite a long time afterwards. And that's when you had the Second Crusades of Richard II and so on. Uh, Richard I, I should say, the Lionheart. Um, but the Templars were supposedly searching for the, the uh, Holy Grail, and I don't think they found it. And I don't think they found the Ark of the Covenant either, as some people like to believe. What they did have it was, was a lot of money. Um, it was big business. <coughs> they formed a sort of banking system that you could deposit money uh, in your home country and have a promissory note, take it to Jerusalem, cash it in with your Templars there um, for accommodation and whatever you needed. So... Uh, People used that system, and the Templars gathered a lot of money, and they were also bequeathed lands by knights and families. <coughs> so they became very rich, and unfortunately that rather corrupted them. I don't think there ever were 
uh, an actual grail order, um, but they may well have gone in search of it. And whatever they found was considered heretical by the church, and the, the order was disbanded. And the last um, uh, Grand Master of the Templars was burnt at the stake, um, I think in 1315. So that's the Templars. And, but they certainly did know something. In 1348, an attempt was made by King Edward III to create a new round table reminiscent of that of King Arthur. Now, bear in mind, the Templars had been disbanded some 30 years earlier during the reign of his father, Edward II, and the Temple Church in London had been taken over by the royal family and then given to the Knights of Spitler. So Edward III... Uh, he obviously regretted that, and he wanted to create a new round table like King Arthur had had. So they built a round tower at Windsor, and he founded the Order of the Garter, um, and called the Knights of the Garter. It has never been a real school, but rather more of a fashion statement. I'm being a bit facetious there. It persists to this day though the membership is not exactly esoteric. No, it is not. Um, one of the most recent, if not the most recent, Knight of the Garter is Tony Blair. Can you believe it? Um, this is the most prestigious order in the world, and he gets given the garter. No wonder he wore his garter robes, as did Prince Andrew, while sitting in the, uh, the, uh, the stalls... <laughs> at the coronation of uh, our new King Charles III. Uh, anyway, um, they, he founded that order, and they, they have their meetings in the chapel, uh, St. George's Chapel. St. George is the patron of the order. He's also the patron saint of England, by the way. Um, and that, that's where they had their stalls, and they each have their banner hanging over their stall. And you can only join the order if someone dies so it's a question of there are always 24 of them plus the monarch and plus the uh, Prince of Wales who is the heir to the throne I think there may be a few more nowadays that they have uh, uh, people like Princess Anne is a member of the, the order of the garter so um, anyway uh, that's the order founded to reform King Arthur's round table and in Edward III's day they were all uh, his best knights they were a fighting order nowadays they're mostly old men a um, bit of patronage a bit of pomp and splendour in your old age um, it's not exactly a fighting order in the meantime other schools have come and gone most have been at best inspirational but many have been decidedly suspect Let's have a look at them. So, in 1618, Speculum Sophicum Rhodostaricum, the mirror of the wisdom of the rosy cross, was published in 1618. And this is the frontispiece. Um, four years earlier, an unknown brotherhood of Christian rosy cross announced itself. And these two manifestos of the order were published. The first in... 1614 is called the Fama Fraternitatis, the fame of the brotherhood. And the second one, 1615, is called the Confessio Fraternitatis, uh, the confession of the brotherhood. Confession in this case doesn't mean, well, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It means the history and uh, the truth, the, you know, the true saying of the history of the order which it purports to be. And it tells us, it's claimed that the Brotherhood had been set up in secret by an unknown German scholar called Christian Rosenkreuz. Rosenkreuz is German for Rosy Cross, referred to as CRC, Christian Rosenkreuz. He was evidently born in 1378 and lived to be 110. So... That's about 30 years after the founding of the Order of the Garter. And 
we don't know if this personage ever really lived. The story goes that as a young man, he was going on um, pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He got shipwrecked and he ended up in Syria and was taken to Damascus. And there he met um, wise men. Uh, I think they were Muslims, actually who taught him their arts and healing in particular. Damascus was a major centre at that time. And uh, he then went to other places, particularly in North Africa, and he learnt about alchemy, he learnt about this, that and the other. And then he came back to Germany and he was going to teach them the sciences that he'd learnt in the East. But nobody wanted to hear, that, or certainly not the priesthood or the university um, they didn't want to know. So um, he then turned to the ordinary people and he formed a, a little group of eight uh, followers and himself and he taught them what he knew and they kept this their, their secret for, you know, until the time of, you know, father to son going down until the time of the Rosicrucian pamphlets being published in 1614. That's the myth, that's the, the, uh, the story as given. So it's generally regarded as a hoax, but I think a better word would be ludibrium, which means a game. In other words, I don't think we're meant to take this as literal, not necessarily, but there is the, if you follow the clues within it, it will lead you to what is the real thing, um, which is the the order as it really was, which I think was probably in Heidelberg at the time they're talking about. Um, anyway, the speculum sophicum rhodo stauroticum, oh, that's a big word, isn't it? Rhodo stauroticum, the mirror of the wisdom of the rosy cross, was published in 1618, so that's four years after the farmer. And the frontispiece shown here is full of esoteric symbolism. So first of all, um, events have been prophesied by the 1603 nova or supernova in Ophiuchus. Now you can see that here. This is the constellation of Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer. Ophiuchus is associated with Imhotep. That's the representation of Inhotep. It's sometimes called the 13th sign of the zodiac. And he's holding a serpent because he has power over serpents. The serpent can bite him, but it can't hurt him. Um, and here is the Nova Star in Ophiuchus. And they saw that as being propitious. 1603 was an important year. It's when Queen Elizabeth died. But from the Rosicrucian point of view, it was also when James I or of England, 6th of Scotland, came onto the throne of England after Queen Elizabeth. So I believe there's a close link between the Rosicrucians and the, the Stuart monarchy. So that would be why they see 1603 as so important. And in 1604, <clears throat> there's another one in the Cygnus the Swan constellation. Uh, that's known as the Northern Cross, and it, it's important because my research has revealed that actually on the day of the crucifixion itself, and I've worked that out, you can read my book Signs in the Sky about that, uh, that as the moment of Jesus' death, that was overhead um, in the sky over Jerusalem. It's called the Northern Cross. It's the equivalent of the Southern Cross, and it represents the crucifixion. And in some uh, pictorial zodiacs, you'll see St. Helen holding that cross for Cygnus the Swan. So you see here on here, 1618, Collegium Fraternitatis. And that's the College of the, the Rosicrucians. And you see above here this cloud with the Four letters in Hebrew, yod heh vau -Heh, the unpronounceable tetragrammaton, the name of God. And here's the hand of God holding the string that supports the rosy cross. In other words, he's the puppet master. God is directing this thing 
that's being done now. And when you move further down into the image, you see it's under the, the wings, under the protection, the, the wings of God uh, holding it aloft. That's a, a quote from, I think it might be Isaiah. It's either Isaiah or the Psalms. I can't remember now. Anyway, we have here a sword that carries the message cavete. You can see that written there, cavete, which means be careful in Latin. So it's telling you to be careful. And, and there's a hit, another reminder here why you should be careful. There's Noah's Ark on top of a mountain. Um, we need to not be corrupt as they were at the time of Noah. But we're also warned in the Bible, uh, in chapter 24 of Matthew's Gospel, that the end of the age, the end times, when Jesus comes, will be as in the times of Noah. So, again, there's another reference to Noah. And, of course, Noah was the great-grandson of Enoch, who was the pre-Diluvian great prophet. Now, we see on the other side, a trumpet holds the message, heralds the message, CRF, Christian Rosenkreuz Fraternitas. So there's the trumpet blowing. There's CRF written underneath it. Over the window, it says, Jesus nomen omnia, Jesus for us everything. So they're saying they're truly Jesus, you know, they're true Christians. He means everything to them. And you see here a man falling off a cliff. Uh, you'll see him here. A man in, in ignorance, he falls to his death from a cliff. In other words, you don't know what lies ahead of you. You might be walking along thinking that the path is secure. Um, you have a sudden death. You, don't, you know, don't know what's ahead of you. Don't take life for granted. Uh, it could end at any time. And then there's another man here praying. He has the direct link going up to God. He's praying to God. And he is holding an anchor. Anchors represent hope, um, the hope for salvation. But he's not noticing that the... the, uh, the the means of his salvation is before him. The, the Rosicrucian chariot has arrived. It's lowering its drawbridge. And he has only to go on board. And he could be instructed and he could find the way. But this other gentleman here is striding past. Another man clings to an anchor, symbolizing hope. On his, that, that's him. He prays to God for help. A third man strides past. So he's ignorant. He's not, he, he's not noticing this. It's uh, beyond his ken. None of these men see the invisible college of the Rosicrucians. They're deaf to its message that is being trumpeted to the world. And that's always the problem that esoteric schools have, that people don't notice them, they don't listen, they're not aware. Meanwhile, a nobleman, you can see he's noble, he's wearing a ruff, he's got nice clothes on, he's got a top hat. He's riding a horse, um, a nice horse. Um, and he's riding right, he's looking the other way. He's not seeing this at all, this chariot. He's looking the other way. And you can see here also on the chariot itself, um, it says, Venite Digni, come in, the, the, uh, uh, you, dig you dignified ones, come in. Yeah, so it's, it's an invitation, and the, the invitation is actually given in the farmer, I think, um, to for the wise, the the the, digni, the dignified, to come in and join the college, and there is the rose and the cross either side of it. And you see, it's on wheels. It's a moving college. It's not static. But he's looking the other other direction, so he doesn't notice the college that is right next to him. Yeah. So, but there is another man is winched free from puteus opinionum i.e. the well of opinion he's, he's one that's listened to the message and he's been wound out out of the well he was stuck in there he couldn't get out of uh, the well of opinion and he's been pulled out by the Rosicrucian College and we'll meet one or two people that 
were pulled out, so to speak. Uh, meanwhile, there's another pilgrim going on here, and he's not seeing it. In other words, while others walk or ride or die heedless of the opportunity before them, he hears the call of the college and is set free. That's the guy in the well. Now, one who was wenched free was Robert Flood, and I've talked a, a lot about him in my earlier lectures, and he was a self-proclaimed Rosicrucian. And in one of his books, Summum Bonum, The Highest Good, was published in 1619. So that's only, f what, five years since the first pamphlet? And you can see the Rosicruc Rosicrucian symbolism. You've got the cross here and a rose on top. And it says, Dat rosa mel apibus. The rose gives honey to the bees. So there's a beehive here and a, a, a bee is flying to the rose. He's going to collect the nectar from the rose and take it back to the hive. Now this is a very old symbol of esoteric schools. And you find it uh, there's actually a book from Edessa, which was a famous city of the East, called The Bees. And it's talking about esotericism, the, the nectar of wisdom being collected and stored in the, the beehive. And the bees are the students who come to the source of the nectar to take it back to their hives. But there's also perils here. There's a trellis here, and you can't see it too clearly in this print, but there is a, a, a cobweb here with a spider in it. So there's danger of the bees getting trapped in the web, the web being life, the general life, that uh, they will take, you know, they'll get captured and they'll die, but they have to seek the rose and avoid the traps of uh, the false ways on the... Um, the trap of ignorance uh, symbolised by the web. Now, Flood's philosophy is perhaps best summarised in this diagram called the mirror of the whole of nature and of art the reflection. So, it's... Um, I'm not going to go into this. I have talked about it quite a lot in earlier lectures, but basically what you can see here is you have the figure of nature and she's standing here and you can't really see it too well in, in this picture because it's too small, but she's feeding the world with milk from her breast as nature feeds everything that it lives on this planet. And she has an ape shown down here on a lead or chain to, to his wrist. And he's studying intently. He's looking at a globe. He's got various instruments like a compass and magnifying glass and he's trying to understand what governs how this whole thing works so he's a scientist in essence but he's also represents mankind and how mankind is held trapped on this world by nature that's not how we tend to think of it we think of the earth as being a sort of paradise but if you actually look at the earth it's a battleground it's a battleground between plants. It's a battleground between the weeds trying to stuff out other plants. It's a battleground of animals eating the weeds, eating the plants, uh, animals attacking and eating each other. It's, it's a, a, a really quite frightening place. It looks beautiful, but it's also a very dark place, and we find ourselves in it. And nature herself is trapped too. She's held by God there's a line coming down here to her wrist. And the message, the overall message of this picture, and as I say, I'm not going to explain it in depth, but is that we have to get free from being the pet of nature to being connected ourselves directly to God. And that's what Christianity, the Rosicrucians, and everything is about, is how do we re-establish our direct connection to the Logos, to God, um, outside of nature if we can do that then we can escape from nature escape from being trapped on this planet very deep message so it depicts nature as a woman eve eve means the, the mother of all things by the way who feeds all of nature she has an ape symbolizing mankind on a chain here's her pet 
but she likewise is chained to the hand of God. So she's not as free as she might think. The message is clear. Man must break free from nature and link directly to God. So Flood's work is all about that. And Flood wrote many highly illustrated books on his Rosicrucian ideas. This is taken from one of them, uh, The Divine Monochord. And these diagrams show a remarkable congruency between his ideas and those of Gurdjieff, claimed to have brought back from the East. Gurdjieff writes a lot about the ray of creation and connecting it with music. Well, we see the same teachings here in floods. You know, there's, there's the sun, the, these are different spheres of the planets, and then the, there's higher spheres above the sun. Uh, it's the same basic teaching, but Gurdjieff could never have met flood. <laughs> um, yet Gurdjieff could not have learnt from the Englishman who lived 300 years before his time. Was there a common source? Well, I think there was. Another self-proclaimed Rosicrucian was a German physician, alchemist and teacher called Michael Mayer. As he was in England between 1611 and 1616, it is quite possible that he met Robert Flood. He may even have introduced him to the Rosicrucian philosophy. He too wrote highly illustrated books sharing the same printers, De Bry of Oppenheim, um, Oppenheim was a, a city uh, within the Palatinate, which was a, a little principality uh, on the Rhine that was ruled over by um, its own prince, uh, who was an elector. He was an elector of the, the emperor. And he was married, this prince, Frederick V, was married to the daughter of James I, Elizabeth um, and uh, that's the, their capital uh, was Heidelberg, which I believe was the center of this Rosicrucian uh, revival, or you know, opportunity, you could call it. It was a very sort of, for the time, it was a sort of new age capital, very, very um, uh, with it place. Um, and Oppenheim was the main printing area. And they've printed a lot of books on alchemy as well as these Rosicrucian books. So I've written about that in another of my books called The New Jerusalem, but you'll find quite a bit of information on that there. Mayer's most famous book is called The Flight of Atalanta. It was published in 1616. Well, Atalanta Fugiens is an allegorical work supposedly about the Greek myth of Atalanta, Atalanta's running race. In actuality, the book is a metaphor for personal transformation through internal alchemy. I should say that this is a Greek myth. Atalanta was this beautiful girl who was very fleet of foot, and no one could run as fast as her. And she promised her father that she would marry the man who could catch her, um, but he would have to, anyone who tried and failed would have to be put to death. So there were many suitors, but they all failed until one guy came along, and he had the brilliant idea of dropping golden apples in her path, and she would stoop down to pick them up, and he would be able to race on. So he did actually manage to beat her, um, but maybe she let him win because she fancied him. Who knows? Anyway, that's the, the, the overall story. Um, but the illustration so shows mankind, or one of the illustrations, asleep in a grave in the embrace of a dragon. The dragon, i.e. Satan, or perhaps its nature, keeps him asleep so that he does not even see the ruins of former civilizations around him. There is Rome, shown by the Colosseum here, there is Egypt. Well, we've got these pointy pyramids there in the distance. And then there's medieval Christendom with this ruined church with an archway there. She, he's not seeing any of that. Instead, he dreams his life away till he dies in his grave. And this is very much, uh, reminds me of uh, the film, the movie, The Matrix. And I hope you've seen it. Uh, if you haven't, you really should. It's probably the best sci-fi movie ever made. Um, it shows that 
everyone's asleep and they're having their energy stolen by a machine world while they sleep and they dream and they're dreaming within the matrix like the sort of computer game that they're all engaged in but it's not real life and they need to wake up to real life which actually at first is not very nice because they find themselves in an awful situation in a, 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 a ruined world ruled over by machines but they have to fight back and I'm not going to go into any more of that but it's this whole idea of the the hypnotic uh, dragon holding this person asleep in their grave if they don't wake up they're going to remain in that grave and just die there and uh, you know that's the end of them it's a cautionary image this image too has echoes of Gurdjieff who taught that our primary struggle is to wake up to the peril of our own predicament and that we need to do it has to be remembered that the dragon has a vested interest in keeping mankind asleep. Many false gurus, messiahs, magicians and occultists have come and gone over the centuries, promising much but delivering only negative results. Now I put in this other image here um, from an alchemical book that was published in 1622, again from Heidelberg, I think. Um, either there or Oppenheim uh, it's, this is called the white stone and the white stone is one of the goals of alchemy if you have this stone in your possession you can project it onto base metal and turn it into silver and you see here this tree with moons on it that represents silver so this figure here you wonder what this has to do with alchemy at all but basically this figure here represents us as our higher self. We have to have dominion over the serpent. That's your lower brain self in your spine that uh, controls your habits and your instincts. And you have to have control over the lion. That's your emotions, your emotional mammalian self. Uh, so to become the master... You have to control both of these. And then you can have the silver stone, uh, the white stone, which gives you silver. And this is all to do with the Holy Grail. In terms of esoteric illustrations concerning alchemy, this book is the most extraordinary of all. And this picture has little to do with chemistry, but a deep is deeply esoteric. Well, it is. Now then, coming back to Britain... Sir Thomas Gresham was a banker to the English crown. He taught that the stability of the currency depended on the crown's creditworthiness. You've probably heard Gresham's law, bad money drives out good. And he, he certainly believed that and he enforced it. And he made sure that all debts were paid on time for, from the crown, the crown estate, was able to negotiate favourable terms for Elizabeth I with the bankers of Amsterdam. So under her reign, England's uh, finances were restored from the uh, bad condition they had been left in by Henry VIII and his other two successors. So Sir Thomas Gresham, you know, he was a banker, but he did good work. And Gresham College was founded in 1597 with premises at the former home of Sir Thomas Gresham. And his arms were prominently displayed there and were adopted by Gresham College. So when he died, uh, he left half of his money for... Uh, he left the building of his house after his widow had died to form a college, Gresham College. And he left a large amount of his money, half of it, I think, to uh, be used uh, as a, uh, what's the right word, um, bequest for the support of teachers for this college. And they were going to teach the seven liberal arts to the people of London for free. So the professors would be paid out of the fund from the money he left, uh, entrusted to 
uh, one of the guilds, I believe, of London. And um, they were, the, the, it, this was done so that the educational level of Londoners could be raised. Um, unfortunately, the Londoners weren't that interested in having lectures on mathematics and astronomy and uh, the other liberal arts. They preferred to go to the theatre and bear baiting and things like that <laughs> in their spare time. So as a college, it failed utterly. But by creating this college and having these seven professorial seats available, it provided a situation where real scholars didn't have to worry about their material support. They could give a, a lecture a week, perhaps, to an empty room, <laughs> because no one was coming to the lectures, but they could meet among themselves and discuss science and topics of interest. And this led to the formation of something called the Invisible College. So in 1643, a group of professors and others began holding scientific meetings here at Gresham College. The group was named the Invisible College. They're invisible because they didn't have their own premises. And they mostly used to correspond with each other by letter. And they had members in Europe. Um, later on, they would have members in America. And people would send uh, copies of uh, essays they had written based on experiments that had been carried out. And they had demonstration lectures at the college. So if anyone was in London, they could come along to those and see it. Um, but the proceedings of the college would then be mailed out to the other members. So um, this is the, how the whole idea of journals came out about, published journals by um, a reputable authority, in this case, the Invisible College, the Gresham College. Um, and these are the arms and crest of Sir Thomas Gresham. And you can see uh, it has this grasshopper, which you can see this one here um, actually in Lombard Street in the city of London. And th these were prom premises that were one time owned by Sir Thomas Gresham uh, in 1563. He must have bought this place and founded a, uh, a jewellery store and uh, which doubled up as a bank. This later became Martin's Bank and that, they took over the symbol of the grasshopper. So the Invisible College was more than a scientific body, although this was important. It was a group of intelligent men seeking the truth about the laws of God and nature. Many of them were alchemists, some were bishops, and they were all very influenced by the current of ideas released by the Rosicrucian Furore. And I actually have in my possession a golden grasshopper which someone very kindly sent me, um, I take that as a, an endorsement that it's time for me to take the banner or the mantle of Gresham College, or the real Gresham College, there is a Gresham College now, but the Invisible College, uh, the aspect of it as a, a school of esotericism, which is what I believe it should really be. So we're going to use this as our emblem now the golden grasshopper, uh, who the, the, one of the symbols of the grasshopper is it always jumps forwards. And that's what we have to do. We have to move forwards and take this thing to the next level. So thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed this little lecture. And we'll take this forwards. Uh, if you want to join the college, it's very easy to do. You just go to patreon.com forward slash Adrian G Gilbert and that will take you to my page and that will show you um, how you can join the college and there are different tiers um, depending where you want to be and we have our own circle of nights <laughs> um, but that's one of the tiers and I'm uh, we're working on the grail ideas in that circle uh, but Find your own level within the college and there's many lectures that you can also find on YouTube that are free uh, under my YouTube 
um, Adrian G. Gilbert. Uh, one, Adrian G. Gilbert One, I think it is on YouTube. So I hope you enjoyed that and um, we'll see you again. Bye bye.